Dr. Miriam Grossman is a child psychiatrist who is fighting against gender ideology in her profession. She has written a couple books, the latest of which is called Lost in Trans Nation, about this chaos and craziness that is going on in the medical world when it comes to gender confusion. And so from a scientific a uh, psychiatric medical perspective. She is going to tell us why this ideology is not only scientifically wrong, but also morally destructive. Um, you are not going to want to miss anything she says. Make sure that you have a notepad out so you can take notes. She is brilliant and she helps so much offer clarity to this very confusing issue. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Dr. Grossman, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Um, for those who may not know, can you tell everyone who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, well, I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist and author. And uh, in my practice, I see kids who are distressed about their sex, about being a boy or a girl, and their parents. And I've also written a number of books. Um, most recently, I wrote a book called Lost in Transnation, A Child Psychiatrist's Guide Out of the Madness. Mm. And the book before that was about sex education, and it was called You're Teaching My Child What? And I think that we probably are going to talk about both of them. Both of them, yes. And you wrote the book about sex education in 2009, where you start to touch on the gender stuff. So that's before most of us knew what Correct. what was going on. Um, was that your specialty at that point in your practice? Were you talking then to kids who were distressed about their sex? Oh, no, not at all. Okay. Because that was way before the current, you know, skyrocketing of cases. So at that time, it was extremely rare to have a child who, you know, was unhappy about their body. Right. The reason that I wrote about it in that earlier book is because I was studying um, sex education. And I came across gender ideology within sex education. Mm. Okay, so Planned Parenthood, and then there's an organization called SECUS. Mm -hmm. um, and these are federally funded uh, organizations that have curricula and websites for students. Mm -hmm. And so I stumbled across, so to speak, all this material about gender in which kids were being told uh, that sex is between the legs, gender is between the ears, and they don't always necessarily have to match. Mm. Boys do not always become men. Women, girls do not always grow up to be women. There's a huge spectrum uh, that sex is a spectrum with, with male and female on either end, and then limitless possibilities on that spectrum. And only you know where you fall on that spectrum. So you were reading that over 10 years, like 15 years ago, yes. you were reading that in sex education. Yes. Now, what made you start looking into the sex education that was being made available to students? Well, the reason I did that is because so many of my young patients who were college students uh, had sexually transmitted infections and uh, one or more abortions, and this was impacting their mental health. Okay, so I, would, I was working at UCLA, mm -hmm. and I would only see UCLA students. So these were extremely bright, accomplished young people, and yet they still had made poor decisions in terms of their sexual health. And a third of the girls uh, had, had the HPV infection, the wow. human papillomavirus, which causes genital warts and sometimes cervical cancer. Right. And so, you know, this is this is nothing to dismiss. It's it, it's a serious thing. 
And when I learned that so many of these girls that I was seeing had the infection and, you know, they were young and they may have only had one or two sexual partners um, and yet they were infected and now they had to worry about treatment and they had to worry about possibly developing cancer later on. They had to worry about, you know, transmitting the virus to somebody else. These are heavy, heavy things. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered, what are these kids being taught about sexual health? And that's when I, I took a deep dive mm -hmm. into it. And I discovered that Planned Parenthood and, like I said, SICUS and other organizations um, are, are the, the, the main ones, sort of the flagship organizations that have curricula that are being widely used. They have uh, websites for young people and they're simply not giving them the information that they need. You know, a lot of people, I think, separate, probably myself included until a couple years ago, separated the problem of encouraging sexual, quote unquote, liberation, promiscuity, and the gender issue, gender ideology. But you're saying those things have kind of gone hand in hand or have at least been placed under the same umbrella of sexual education for a very long time. Why is that? Like, what's the connection between telling someone, yeah, have sex as many times as you want to, as long as you're comfortable with it, whatever, and telling someone, you know, boys don't necessarily grow up to be men. Why are those things going together? You know, that's, that's really a good question. Um, the truth is that they're not necessarily related. One is sexuality sexual preferences, sexual behaviors, um, and the other has to do with identity as male or female. But they have been lumped together. They've been lumped together by the sex educators so that we have sexuality and gender education. They do go hand in hand. And when I first came across all the, the gender material when I was studying you know, what, what kids are told about pregnancy and condoms and STIs. I just, I thought this was just so bizarre. Right. I mean, what is this, what is this all about? What is this doing here? Why are we telling young people these crazy ideas that are anti-science, anti-science? I mean, sex is binary. Mammals are either male or female. Mm -hmm. We are mammals. To say nothing of the fact that God created man, you know, male and female. Mm -hmm. But let's say just let's say we're going to stick to the hard science here. We are mammals and mammals are either male or female. Other species, okay, they may have all sorts of variations. They may have, you know, organisms that change there between male or female. But that's not that's not us. That's mm -hmm. not human beings. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we are uh, from the moment of uh, conception, from the moment that the egg is fertilized by the sperm, you have either a male or a female uh, embryo. And that's going to be permanent. And that cannot be changed mm -hmm. with medication, with surgeries. That is never going to change. So um, those are simply biological truths, mm -hmm. and they're not being presented to our kids. The opposite is being presented. Kids are being told that there's such a thing as a kind of psychological sex, which is um, completely separate from biology, separate from chromosomes. And yes, I mean, that might exist, but it's not based on anything scientific. Okay, it's like saying, okay, we believe that we all have a soul, but there's no hard science behind that that we have yet, and we're certainly not teaching it in public schools because it's part of a belief system. In the same way, the idea of gender, the idea of having this separate identity that has nothing to do with biology, and, and, and in addition, can be in conflict, can be a mismatch 
so that you can have a gender of being male and the a physical reality of being female and gender ideology is saying well that's just a normal variant yeah yeah you this make... is oh god no it's just it's very dangerous and it's anti-science Okay, first sponsor, let me tell you about We Heart Nutrition. They're a new sponsor. I'm so excited that they're now a part of the show. The owners, Jacob and Kristen, uh, they started this company because they saw a hole in the supplement industry. They felt like there just weren't enough options of supplements with wholesome ingredients, but also companies that share our Christian values. And so they decided to start We Heart Nutrition with both of those things. And they also donate a portion of every sale to support pregnancy centers. A 10% of every sale is given back to pregnancy care centers. Right now they're raising $10,000 for Prestonwood Pregnancy Center. That's a pregnancy center in Texas. And they just absolutely have amazing products that I really love. They're all made in the USA with the highest quality research back ingredients, third party tested to ensure purity and quality, and are always made in the most bioavailable form so that your body can actually absorb this stuff. But if for whatever reason it doesn't work for you, they do have a 14 day no questions asked return policy. I use their supplements. I've been taking their postnatal vitamins and their DHA. Absolutely love it. Go to weheartnutrition.com. Use promo code Allie for 20% off. Weheartnutrition.com, code Allie. You make a good point about it being a belief. I've heard people talk about gender ideology or this idea that you have this inner understanding of like your secret and truer self your psychological sex as you said it's really like a gnostic belief it's more of a kind of pseudo religious belief than it is certainly a scientific fact something that i heard you say at a lecture recently um every cell has a sex and that matters i want you to explain that and talk about like Okay, then that means there are some medical implications to saying that a man who was born a man is actually a woman or vice versa. Okay. Um, yeah, this is, you know, I love, I love the science behind this because it's so, so interesting. Mm -hmm. And there's been an explosion of science. Um, uh, in fact, it's called gender-specific medicine. And the reason for that new field of medicine is precisely because each cell that has a nucleus, which is nearly every cell in the body, um, there's a code that's embedded in that cell, which is the code that's on the chromosomes. And whether you have XX, uh, you know, a genetic endowment of XX or female, or a genetic endowment of, of XY male, we know now makes a huge difference in terms of the functioning of every cell with a nucleus. So even, you know, the heart cells, the brain cells, liver cells, skin cells, okay, the immune system, we have a tremendous amount of information now that tells us that that code within the cell is impacting the functioning of the cell and therefore the functioning of the organ. And so we have, for example, um, you know, certain, uh, certain diseases which are much, much more common in women, autoimmune diseases, 80% um, of those cases are in women. We know that uh, women are able to fight certain infections better than men. We know that men do better when, if, there's, if they're severely burned they do better than women. I mean, there's thousands of examples. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what? One that I love is if somebody needs a kidney transplant, we now know that, for example, if a woman needs a kidney transplant, she has more of a chance of accepting that transplant and not rejecting it if she gets the kidney from another woman. Right. Makes Otherwise... Sense. The kidney that she's going to get from a man 
has all those Y chromosomes. Yeah. And her body wow. is going to recognize that as foreign. Right. And then could therefore reject the kidney. So, you know, when we tell kids, and Ali Beth, we are indoctrinating the youngest of children now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very young children. You know, we, we have, there are books that are board books. I mean, yeah. you have a bunch of little kids. Mm -hmm. Board books that are supposed to be read by adults to the kids. The kids are too young to read. And they say things like, you know, um, only you know if you're a boy or a girl. The adults may have made a mistake when they made that decision when you were born. They took a look at you when you were born, and they said you're a girl or a boy. They may have gotten it right, but they may have gotten it wrong. Yeah. And only you know if you're a girl, a boy, neither, or both. Mm -hmm. This is what our little kids are being told. Yeah. So it shouldn't be any surprise when they get a bit older and they're surrounded, you know, in the culture, the media, you know, the activism at schools, uh, our government agencies, uh, pediatricians, you know, you name it, therapists are promoting this idea that a person's uh, feeling of being male or female can be mismatched with their bodies. Yeah. And that is just a variant of normal. It's like the same way that you can have a mismatch of socks when they come out of the dryer. Yeah. <laughs> you can have a mismatch of your identity with your body. Right. And it's your body that needs to be changed to match your mind. Yeah. Wow. I'm so interested to hear from your professional um, perspective uh, uh, what you think about what I'm about to say. I think about my kids. I only know this from my personal experience. And I have uh, two of them, four and two, and then the newborn. But what I notice about my two older ones is that they're constantly trying to put things into categories. They are trying to, th okay, we do this during the day. We do this at night. This is what mommy does. This is what daddy does. This is what a man looks like. This is what a woman looks like. That's a boy. That's a girl. Do I do that? You know, they're figuring things yes. out. And to me, I, I, that is just a normal part of development. Sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes they call a man miss. You know, they're figuring that out along yes. with language. It's a lot to learn. And to me, it seems cruel to offer anything to them except for clarity. Like, I want to give them as much clarity as possible that, yes, you've got that category correct. Yes, you've got that designation right. Or, no, that's not. And, obviously, as they grow, they learn nuances of that, right? But they're still kind of in that black-white thinking, and you want to help them as much as possible. To me, it seems cruel psychologically to purposely confuse the child and put a burden on a child at such a young age to say, you can decide something as core as your gender. So, like, what does it do to a child in those formative years to be brought that kind of confusion? Beautifully said. You said that so well. Children, as part of their development, want to understand the world. They're working every day to understand things on their own level. And you're right. At an early age, there is no appreciation or hardly any appreciation for nuance. You know, you get that when you're older. But we certainly are doing no favor to these kids. I would say it's, it's destructive to their development to, to present such a confusing and really non-reality based uh, understanding of something that's at the core of their humanity, which is whether they're a boy or a girl. And the end result, yes, is a lot of confusion. And I believe that that is one of the goals of all this. This is a social movement. And one of the goals is confusion. And boy, do we have confusion. Confusion. 
Okay, another break to tell y'all about Good Ranchers. You know we love Good Ranchers in the Stucky home. This is all American meat. Meat from American farms and ranches. You've got better than organic chicken, pre-marinated, not pre-marinated. You've got the ground beef. That's what we use the most. You've got all different cuts of steak. And if you subscribe, um, it'll show up at your front door, whatever kind of box of meat that you want. You pick it out on the website every month. It just makes your life so much easier. You don't have to go to the grocery store. You don't have to worry about inflation because their prices are so reasonable. Plus, if you use my code Allie at checkout, you save an extra 10% on every order. This is an amazing Christmas gift and so thoughtful and unique. Give it to the related bro in your life. Give it to your husband. Give it to your dad, your brother, your friend, whatever. This is a great, great gift. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie for an extra 10% off your order. GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Going back to what we were talking about, about the connection between like promiscuity, sexuality, and then so-called gender identity. I heard you connect to those two things. Um, in the lecture where I heard you speak um, by saying, you know, uh, Alfred Kinsey and John Money, as we'll get into in just a second, they really kind of, they they wanted to push back against and I guess you could say demolish Christian morality and the nuclear family. And so I guess you could say that is maybe a connection between those two those two things is both of both promiscuity have sex with whoever you want however you want and oh you don't have to be a man if you were born a boy both of those things are an assault on reality scientific truth but also moral truth and also just familial stability too right yes and so let's go back to that tell us a little bit we could spend hours and hours on this but about john money alfred kinsey and their worldview that motivated them to do the things that they did. Sure. And, you know, I go into all this in, um, actually, in, in both the books that we're talking about. Um, You're Teaching My Child What um, would be mo- more about Kinsey, and then um, Lost in Trans Nation is more about money, John Money, just because John Money really was the founding father, you could say, of gender ideology. But they did have a lot in common, and they were colleagues. I mean, Kinsey Kinsey was older than Money, um, but they were both, they were both, well, to begin with, they were both professors, eminent, respected professors, you know, with, with white lab coats at um, esteemed universities, uh, uh, Kinsey was at the at Indiana University, and Money was at Johns Hopkins. Um, they were both very disturbed people, very disturbed, immoral, um, pedophiles. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'll spare you the details. Mm-hmm. Uh, disturbed and immoral and Perverse. yes wicked mm-hmm. wicked people mm-hmm. child abusers yeah liars um not good player not not good guys mm-hmm. but of course that wasn't known at the time that they were coming out with all their research now kinsey his focus was on sexuality and he was uh here's a word you don't hear anymore a pervert he was a he was a sexual deviant, mm-hmm. uh, and if anyone doubts that, they can pick up the biography written about Kinsey. Um, and I warn you, it's difficult read, uh, but that's kind of the definition of deviant yeah. sexual behavior. Mm-hmm. So what he wanted to do, it seems, was convince the world that he was just like everyone else. He was just a regular guy. And um, he came out with research that he claimed proved that, you know, the average was in the 50s, okay, 50s and 60s. The average, you know, mom and pop with the white picket fence were all engaged in what society then would have considered immoral behaviors. 
And so you can imagine, you know, his his literature, his books um, on male and female sexuality were were bombshells. You know, they they just you know people were in shock, and he became very famous. Um, and his work launched the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s. Now, it became known later on that his research was fraudulent. Yeah. And it was criminal because it was based on, uh, I mean, this, this is shocking, it, it was based on child molestation mm -hmm. um, by, you know, jailed uh child abusers and the whole thing is is very outrageous so, so he based his observations what he called observations on human sexuality which basically he said was oh uh humans uh human beings are basically just like animals they can and should have sex however they want to with whoever they want to and he based those observations on his correspondence with child molesters that's correct and jailed pedophiles and he then said oh see we don't have to talk about who this population is but i studied a population and this is true of all humans no he was studying perverts like himself to try to normalize yes. pedophilia and all other kinds of perversion right yes yes and his goal was really to destroy like you said judeo-christian morality the nuclear family social norms. Okay, he was a social reformer. He wanted to change the world. So this was not about health. This was not about science. Obviously, you know, if you're going to have, I mean, the number, the kind of activities and number of quote unquote sexual partners that these people were having, put them at the highest risk possible of sexually transmitted infections, abortions, and all sorts of awful things. Mm -hmm. So this is no way, shape, or form about health. Right. And yet the modern sex education came out of the, the Kinsey philosophy. Right. And the people that, um, that, that formed sex education in the 60s that created modern sex education, um, they were disciples of Kinsey. Okay, so, you know, my point is that sex education as it stands now, and what I'm referring to, Ali Beth, is comprehensive sex right, education. Right. Okay, because there's different kinds of sex education, but so-called, because it's not at all comprehensive, um, is, is based on changing society. And when you go to the website of SECUS, one of those organizations, um, they have it right there on their website. It's right there. It says sex ed for social change. Mm -hmm. So that's what they want. Right. Okay, they're telling us. They're telling us who they are. They want to change society. They, they don't want to be anchored in Judeo-Christian Judeo morality, obviously. They don't want to be anchored in, um, you know, the, the nuclear family in... Um, you know, the, the, the healthy decision of waiting until adulthood uh, for sexual behavior and optimally having one lifelong partner. You see, the people that, are, that, that delay sexual behavior, the young people, and then they marry somebody who also delayed sexual behavior, they have zero risk zero right. of any sexually transmitted infection. And this is what kids are not being told. They're being yeah. told, you know what, everyone gets everyone gets these STIs. Just, you know, try, you know, wear a condom yeah. and if you get one, it's no big deal because everyone has them. Well, hello. No. Yeah. Not everyone has them at all. Speak for yourself. Yeah. I don't even think some adults understand that. I, I tweeted the other day because I was thinking about this and like a whole other things, just like the broken hearts that happen when you have children outside of marriage and all this stuff. And I said, I just tweeted, it's underestimated how many problems in society are caused by sex yes. outside of marriage. And of course, I got pushed back on that, as is, you know, usual when you say anything on Twitter. But there, I 
I clarified underneath, I listed, you know, unwanted pregnancies, single parenthood, STDs, all heart, broken hearts, all that stuff. And it was amazing the replies I got from adults saying all of those things can happen within marriage too. Well, no, you're not going to get an STD if both of you waited until marriage to have sex and you're the only people yeah. that you've had. You're not. You're not. But you I know think what? people don't understand. But you know what? They see it, and this is also because of sex education, as being unrealistic. Yeah, right. It's just not realistic. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's just too difficult. Well, you know, I find it very difficult, as do many other people, to eat right, to exercise, and that all those long list of things that, you know, we, we still, we have to make the best effort we can. And more important than that, the authorities have to present it as an ideal, mm. okay? So if I go to some website or I go to my doctor or something, you know, and, and she says to me, okay, Miriam, you've got to eat, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you've got to stop, you know, the sugar and stop all the bad things that I'm doing. Okay. So she's presenting an ideal to me. Okay. And she's not saying to herself, you know what? It's not realistic. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell her to do that because it's not realistic. No, I'm going to present an ideal. Mm -hmm. And when you look at young people, and this was particularly clear to me at UCLA, where the kids were very self-disciplined, and a lot of them were athletes. They were like getting up at four in the morning, you know, to swim a hundred laps. Well, hello, if you have so much self-discipline in one area, I think that it's, it's not unreasonable to at least be asked or told by the authorities and encouraged to have self-discipline in this other area. Okay. Well, one thing I love about my sponsors is that they share our values. I love presenting companies to you that they don't just make products or offer services that I know that you're going to love, but they also stand on the same principles that you and I do so we can feel really good about sending our dollars to them because we know they're not going to turn around and then donate our dollars to causes that we don't believe in. They're fighting for the same things you and I are. And Public Square makes that really easy. So if you're looking for an alternative to some kind of woke secular company that you don't want to be doing business with anymore, then you need the Public Square app. If you go to publicsq.com or search Public SQ in the App Store and download the app, and you enter your location, you'll see all these local businesses that you can support that support the things that you believe in. So your local coffee shop that fought against vaccine mandates, whatever it is, you can find on Public Square. And you can also list your business so other like-minded people can find you. So go to publicsq.com, download the app today at the app store, publicsq.com. I don't know if you are familiar with Nancy Piercy. I don't know if you know who she is, but she wrote an amazing book. If you haven't read it, you should. It's called Love Thy Body. And she connects this promiscuity with the problem of gender confusion, if you even want to call it that, by talking about just the rejection of our bodies when it comes to its telos, when it comes to its purpose. We hardly ever ask, like, what is the body for? Like, what is the definition of the body? Who made the body? Like, therefore, what is its value? What is its purpose? We just think, well, this is what we want. This is what we want. We worship the God of self. I want to have sex. I want to be the opposite gender. And so that's what you should do without ever asking, but what am I for? What is my gender for? What is my sexuality for? We think so low of ourselves, I think. You know, the way that I would put that is that the body has its own wisdom mm. and it's an awesome wisdom. You know, kids are taught all the time about the environment and about, um, you know, the world, the earth is a, uh, you know, delicate ecosystem and we can't take things for granted. We can't take resources for granted. Our bodies are delicate ecosystems. And you know what? Especially the female body mm -hmm. is a delicate ecosystem. And it is created with so much wisdom. 
And you're right. Instead of saying, well, I want A, B, C, D, we have to look at, and that's why biology is so great. You know, we can look at how we're made and we can take certain messages from that. I'm going to tell you something really good, okay? I wasn't planning on going into this, okay, but I'm now excited. I can't. <laughs> and I know you've just had a baby. If you look at the female menstrual cycle um, and, and the hormones and one hormone that varies during that cycle is oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone, the hormone that helps us to bond with another person, um, to trust that person. So at the time of your cycle, when you ovulate and when you can conceive, that's the time that your estrogen is highest and estrogen pumps up oxytocin. So at the time of your cycle, when um, you could conceive is the time when your body is primed to attach during sexual behavior. And so your body is saying, now is the time that I might create, a, a, well, not I, but my body may be the site of the creation of a new life with another person through this very special and sacred act. And during that act, my body is telling my brain and my heart to attach mm -hmm. and to love and to trust. Right. And I have so much to say to that. One, it reminds me that the whole sexual liberation movement is worse for women. It's worst for women. It might be okay for a guy who can, you know, but even then, I mean, there are emotional, mental things that come with any kind of promiscuity for anyone. But for women, like it is our bodies are made to go with our emotions. Our cycles are made to go with our feelings. Um, and so, gosh, it's been a total, total bad deal for women. Go ahead. You can, well, that's you can for sure. But just getting back to Kinsey. So we just talked a little bit about some hard science, what I just told you about estrogen and oxytocin. So Kinsey, well, we didn't know it back in Kinsey's time, but Kinsey was saying sex is just like a physiological act. Yeah. It, you know, it's like relieving yourself. It's completely disconnected from emotion. Right. And um, that's good. It should be disconnected from emotion. He disconnected it from any sort of consequence whatsoever. It's simply, he said, we, we are human animals. And again, Kinsey uh, was, the, was the source, uh, the founding father, so to speak. His disciples, uh, after he died, carried his philosophy and worldview about human sexuality into today's uh, sex education. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, money, on the other hand, he had the same, the same goal of breaking down norms, breaking down and rejecting the Judeo-Christian value system. Um, he was, he was pro-pedophilia. He argued that sexual behavior between an adult and a child was not necessarily negative. He argued that sexual behavior between a relative and a child incest was not necessarily uh, negative. And he, he said this in public. He was, he was out with his outrageous anti-Judeo-Christian values. And so when it came to gender, he introduced this revolutionary idea that we have a psychological gender that does not necessarily match our physical se sex. And that is exactly what kids are being told. Yeah. And um, they're being told that it's, it's normal, like I said, to have this mismatch. And uh, sadly, my profession, the psychiatric profession, gave its stamp of approval to that idea um, that it's a normal variant to have a mismatch between 
the psyche and the body, and that the body then needs to be uh, changed permanently with these extremely dangerous experimental interventions. All right, last sponsor for the day is ExpressVPN. Okay, this is the sponsor, the product uh, that sponsors my show that I probably use the most because it is always running on the background of all of my devices. It anonymizes my identity when I am online and I'm connected to public Wi-Fi and it uh, reroutes my location so it looks like I'm somewhere else. It's just a way to protect your privacy and this is a really good way to protect yourself from online hackers that can get uh, on the public Wi-Fi and then get into your computer and get all the information that's in your email and all that stuff. You don't want to make yourself vulnerable to those kind of bad actors. That's why you need a VPN. I love ExpressVPN because it's affordable and it's really easy to use. One account can be used on up to five devices. Go to expressvpn.com slash Allie. You'll get an extra three months free when you do expressvpn.com slash Allie to get that extra three months for free. Expressvpn.com slash Allie. Tell me a little bit about the DSM-5. Um, the scandal that happened in the last iteration of this manual of mental disorders that I, I did not know what was going on behind the scenes to include gender dysphoria in that specific language. So tell us about that. Okay, well, very briefly, and, and again, you know, th this is in the book. So the DSM is a manual of, of psychiatric disorders that's put out by the American Psychiatric Association. Um, and they had, since 1980, they had always considered gender identity disorder a disorder. I mean, it was called a disorder. So the non-match, the mismatch, the, the people, mostly they were young boys who from an early age, like Jazz Jennings, okay, would insist that, that, that they're a girl or, or they would, you know, they would very, very much wanna become a girl. Now, that was always considered a disorder that most kids grow out of. But it turned into a social movement and it turned into a huge cultural phenomenon and a political phenomenon. So by the time this most recent DSM, DSM-5 was being um, created, was being written, um, the workforce that was given the task of deciding whether this diagnosis should, should stay in, in, in as a disorder because there were a lot of activists were standing up and saying this is not a disorder, it should be removed from the DSM completely um, because it's stigmatizing yeah. to these unfortunate people. And you know, that, that was the compassionate part of it. So you know, compassion is a good thing. We just, as psychiatrists and psychologists, we're not supposed to be animated by compassion when we decide on diagnoses. But that is what happened. It was, there was political pressure, um, they were moved by compassion, and a decision was made to no longer call it a disorder. Instead, it would, oh, so why didn't they just remove it? That was what you were asking about. They didn't remove it primarily because, you see, individuals, who have this condition, and I don't mean to make light of, I mean, this is a debilitating condition when you feel that your body doesn't match who you are. I mean, one can only imagine how, how awful that is. Um, so I'm not making light of it at all. But, um, so, the reason, so these people are going to need, many of them, if unless they grow out of it, are going to need therapy, medication, and sometimes operations. And so to be reimbursed for all those things, you need a code, a diagnostic code, right, to put on the form for the insurance companies. And if they would have removed gender identity disorder completely, if they had just taken it out of the DSM, there would be no code. And so that would have been very, very difficult. 
So that was an additional reason why they they kept in, they changed the diagnosis so it, it was no longer a disorder. It was simply gender dysphoria. Dysphoria mm -hmm. means discomfort or unhappiness about something. And so the focus of attention by the therapist was supposed to be not the mismatch. That was a normal variant. But the unhappiness that people felt about the mismatch, that was supposed to be the focus of treatment. Right. And so we had that. We got rid of you know the, the stigmatizing aspect. And um, there was still a code to be used for insurance. But you see, this is not just a simple nomenclature revision. This was a seismic shift in terms of the approach because the APA was now saying, the American Psychiatric Association was now saying, this is a normal variant, not a disorder. Yeah. Now, parents that hear about this and, and realize that, that the mismatch that their kid may be experiencing is not a disorder, they assume that well, look, it's the APA. They must have had new evidence. They must have had studies. They must have done a referendum. This decision must have represented a majority of clinicians. But no, no, there was no new research. There was no referendum whatsoever. <laughs> so this decision was made by a small group of people. And I'm just saying that it's, it's deception. It's deceptive to lead parents well, all of us, on into thinking that, you know, all of, all of psychiatry, all of mental health is in agreement. There is no agreement. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I, I mean, I could talk to you for two more hours, <laughs> but we're on, a, we're on a time crunch here. I just wanted to say one more thing about oxytocin, and I'll, I'll try to use that to tie it all together, because you were saying how it's the love hormone, it's what attaches – man and woman in order to have to conceive a child during the right time in the cycle of ovulation for a woman and it's also I heard the word oxytocin a lot during pregnancy because it's also the hormone that has to be triggered in order to have the child so the th same thing and nursing yes and nursing too and so what you said about the female ecosystem being so delicate and so purposeful for this beautiful sacred thing of creating and then holding and the nourishing life for so long is so obviously intentional. And that is why that is why the whole thing of gender confusion and just being able to declare that you're male or female is tragic. It's offensive by the way, that you can just declare yourself female without having all of these things. But it also, you can see why it is fundamentally destructive to society because this beautiful biological complementary relationship between male and female that the entirety of human existence rests upon is being challenged. And it's not going to end well. No. Well, I think that it's all going to collapse because it's so. based on falsehood. But in the meantime, there's a very high body count. Yes. Yes. So I really appreciate you bringing this all out and having me here and um, well, giving me the microphone. You, because you, you, are, you are one person who is helping to topple this. And you coming from your perspective, not very, as you know, not very many people in your industry are willing to speak out. They know better like you. And they're not willing to. So thank you for your courage, really. And thank you for coming on. And we'll link uh, your both of your books, because really everyone needs to get both of your books. We'll link both of them in the description of this episode so everyone can Okay, great. Them. And there's a yeah. lot more on my website also, miriamgrossmanmd.com. Yes. Okay, perfect. We will link that too so everyone can okay. access it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.